Hello and welcome to the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant. Our guest today is Dr. Karen Hardy, but she's not a medical doctor. Today we'll be talking about Flip the Risk, the name of her book, and that's for Enterprise Security. Now, Karen, I'm going to be very, very honest with you. I usually deal with health and wellness issues. So this is not my wheelhouse, so you're going to have to help me. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I figured everybody should be concerned about security and risk. Oh, absolutely. So tell us what you do. Well, um, I am a consultant, and I help organizations uh, implement risk management solutions for the organization. So what does that mean? It means that I help organizations who have mission, goals, and objectives think about the things that can keep them from meeting those mission goals and objectives. And that has a lot to do with managing your risk. Because organizations like people, we get up every morning and we pursue things. We have goals, we have plans. But you have to think about the things that could keep you from achieving those plans. And that's, that's where risk management comes into play because that's sometimes an area of oversight we think about the opportunity so much, we don't take into consideration what things could keep us from achieving our goals. And there's a way to manage risk uh, in your personal life, but also as the book talks about in organizations and in business. Now, how did COVID, which turned the work world, turn companies upside down? How did that impact risk and security? How did um, workplaces have to think in a different way now. Oh, absolutely. You know, I hate to say this, but COVID was um, a learning experience for us. It was tragic because of everything that happened with so many people, but it was also an opportunity for us to, to understand our vulnerabilities in the business environment in which we work and operate. So what it did, it really uncovered a lot of weaknesses that we have in our systems, in our organizations that we may not have thought about before or that we have taken for granted, didn't think to think about. So it really uncovered a lot of the weakness that we have in systems and, you know, we heard about the supply chains and things well, like that. So, so what would you say are those main weaknesses that's, that came to light as a result of this? It's a lot of things. One of them has to do with foresight. Uh, when it comes to, when things happen, a lot of times it's not because we didn't know it could happen, we just didn't take into consideration the impact it would have on us when it happened. So it really has to do with planning and responding to scenarios in business and in our lives. So we got caught shorthanded. We may have had plans that was, you know, tucked away in a, in a drawer somewhere, right? But it's not an active um, application of our response. Um, responding to risk is active, okay? It's not something you just put away into, it happens. You want to be prepared. You want to minimize the impact things have on you. You can't 100% eliminate risk, but you can manage the impact it does have on you. In the case of COVID, we were not prepared in terms of responding. Do we already have a defined response in place if it should happen? You know, the World Economic Forum, I don't know if you ever heard of that uh, organization, uh, they put out an annual global risk report every year and it's a result of international experts coming together and they talk on a global perspective about what are the top risks globally that we need to be concerned about. And they look at specific risks and some of the risks on there have to do with disease and disasters and all of those other things. So the information is there. The question is, at every level, organization, uh, at the individual level, at the leadership level, at the industry sector level, everyone has to be a, 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 an active participant in planning scenarios that could happen, and then when they happen, put into place what your response is. It's about foresight. It's about pre-planning. It's about, I don't want to be caught by surprise. I have a sense that this could happen, and when it does, we're ready to respond. So how did you put the book together? Um, you have some, some folks in there who are experts in that area. Mm -hmm. How did you decide who to put in the book and p how to put the book together so it would be accessible, accessible to everyone? Yeah, so you know, I've been in the risk management industry for 20 years. So I've talked to a lot of people, worked with a lot of people, and 
you know, I realized that, wow, this is important. This is an important skill set to have. And people need to understand, understand it. It's not the most exciting topic out there that catches people's attention. So what I was thinking was, what if I created a book, redesigned it so there's more attractive to just everyday people, even people in the industry, that would draw them into it or pique their interest in understanding the content. So I pulled together some uh, experts in the security risk management uh, field who happen to be all women, because that's, that's a different issue, representation in risk management is underrepresented underrepresented it and, and when it comes to women. Um, so they had the chance to share with them not only their personal stories of risk, but how they use that expertise to manage risk within their organization. How does things like social media impact risk when it comes to, let's just say, what your children are watching and viewing on social media? How can that impact your risk at work? Well, you know, a lot of organizations have social media policies in place to manage the risk of their employees. And it all depends on what the organization want to use it for. You have some organizations that want the em their employees on social media because they're ambassadors. You know, they help to elevate the visibility of a brand. But on the other hand, you have, you know, organizations like government agencies that aren't too happy about that. So people have to be careful about what they share because there's a lot of fraud. People can take your identity yes. and you've seen that on social media. People post, this is not my profile, someone stole it. So that's an opportunity, a lot of fraud out there as well. But it can also be positive, okay? You have to think about what am I getting in return by being on social media versus the risk that's associated do the benefits outweigh the, the risk? And that's the perspective every organization should take, no matter what the risk is, whether there's risk in social media, risk in information technology, risk in cybersecurity, whatever it is. That's the perspective people need to take on. You just mentioned that um, there aren't a lot of uh, uh, women represented in your field. What are you doing to work towards having more women in that area? Or what do you suggest to companies to do to, to find more diversity? Right, so um, diversity and inclusion, belonging, all this is, is a huge topic right now and, and an issue within organizations. A lot of organizations are adopting it, but I want people to understand that you don't have to be a big corporation to have impact when it comes to diversity and inclusion and belonging. For instance, with this book, in my own way, at my own individual level, I'm pulling in women to be included and add to the literature for risk management. That's at my level. At organizations, you need a diversity of thought at the table when decisions are being made that influence people's lives. That's very important to have. So this is not one way to look at anything, so that's where diversity is really strong. What do you feel about the movement to rid companies of DEI? Well, I don't think that's a good idea when you think about long term in terms of demographics of mm -hmm. our communities. I mean, it's obvious you could just look at your, with, with your natural eye and realize that the demographics of our country and, and our environment is, is changing. How can you not include people in the conversation? So I think that's important for companies to align with that and actually set up a strategic diversity plan when that, with that those connections are made in terms of performance and outcomes and inclusion. It's just kind of sad because we're kind of just getting that seat at the table. It takes a while. And you know, it, it's there, some people are trying to just remove that seat. Just when we're, so I guess the answer is to create your own table. It's subset, but. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> but um, it, it, it's just sad that there's this big push and now it's like it's out of fashion to some degree. You know, again, this is where I, it's very important to stress that, yes, you have major corporation and companies. There are a lot of companies that, that are doing it, right? And there are uh, companies that may push back against this. And, and then you have certain demographics of people that don't want to see it, but you have a lot of people that do want to see it. So it's a mixed bag of opinions out there. It's not one just opinion out there. But for organizations that understand the positive impact diversity can have, I'm a witness to it at my individual level. 
And I think people need to take this uh, seriously at wherever level they are, okay? It's just not a corporate problem. Make sure diversity on your baseball team, your, your you know, school board, wh wherever, it cascade all the way down and up. Now, uh, we know each other from college. We do. <laughs> we do. <laughs> sake of disclosure, we, and you were a media major? Yes, journalism media. Yes, so what took you from journalism to risk management? I know when I got out of school, I couldn't find a doggone job. <laughs> that was back <laughs> then. Yes, yeah, couldn't weird. find a doggone job, but I managed to kind of fall into. So what got you into uh, risk management, human resources, that type of stuff? It's interesting, right? Because you, this is no relationship, <laughs> you know, automatic. You don't see the connection to this. One of the things they always told us in, as being a liberal arts major in communication and media is that you will always find a job. So if you're a good communicator, you could succeed at anything in any industry. For me, it was just a matter of connecting with, you know, where do I want to be, what do I want to do at this moment in time in my life. So surprisingly, risk management takes into a lot of those skill sets that you use in communication. One is communication. One is being able to, to work with people. One is be having emotional intelligence. Uh, all of those things are rolled up in risk management because I know this is seen as a technical subject, but there's a human part of risk management because you're, you're managing people who have their own biases, their own assumptions within an organization. Everyone does not manage risk the same and you have to get everyone on board on what, as an organization, how do we define risk? What is our risk philosophy about things, right? You have to have relationships with people to talk about the subject. So it's been extremely beneficial for me to be in risk management. I did not plan to be a risk manager. I started out in banking, but one of the things that was common was that I was always working with people. Um, how do you, what do you tell companies in this information technology era. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about the artificial intelligence, all this. Stuff. It's like the technology is moving faster than our human brains. I know it is. What do you tell companies? How do you, how do you inform them? Well, first of all, I want them to accept what their thoughts are about what they're hearing about AI and generative AI and chat GPT and all of those other things that's happening out there. Again, there are both positive and not so positive sides to, to everything. Let's talk about the not so positive things about AI. First of all, plagiarism, when it comes to intellectual property, uh, that's gonna be an issue. People looking at things like that, and even the elimination of uh, common jobs that we're used to seeing, like journalists <laughs> and content creators and all of those things. On the plus side, I think we've seen this through other, uh, you know, revolutions that has happened within the within our country in terms of industrial and IT and all the other things that have happened. You're going to create new types of jobs, right? Uh, and also integration of AI into business systems, which means that you can produce new sneakers without people. So there's a lot of positives and there's a lot of challenges on both ends. There's a lot that needs to be put into place, especially when it comes to the intellectual property and the copyrights and all of those things, just like what happened in Hollywood while they were striking because of you know their, their likeness is being used without permission. Things like that need to be worked out. But I think it takes a healthy attitude about change to accept because we're at a time of change. And as you know, change is the common denominator of all things. So we need to be excited about the opportunity that comes with this because we're not stopping this train that has already left the station. Now it's about getting a handle on it so that it's beneficial to everyone. You know, the older we get, the, the more resistant we become to change. Mm -hmm. For example, my father has never ever even looked at a computer. <laughs> and it's like, how do you exist? Where my mother, she wanted to know more and mm -hmm, more and more. Mm -hmm. You know, she could play cards on the computer. Right. She could read the Bible mm -hmm. on the computer. So you have people who are resistant. What do you say to people, a lot of people from our generation, they're resistant to this, and this, it's this AI is faster than lightning. <laughs> yes, it is. How do you adjust your mind to the, because you, we've got to keep up. Well, I, I, 
I like to calm people down because people are anxious about the subject, right? And what I like to do is remind them and, and ask them the question, are you a lifelong learner or not? Because if you're a lifelong learner, you will all, you're always open to learn, right? And things become less threatening when you understand it, right? So I really encourage people to take on that persona when it comes to change itself. I have to keep up with it. I, I listen to webinars, I go on Zooms. And that's the great thing about technology is that you could just j jump on a Zoom free webinars everywhere, get on LinkedIn, and you can listen to people and learn from them. So it doesn't take too much effort to become some a student of change. I think it's healthy to do that. Now, th the alternative to that is to be left behind. <laughs> and who likes to be left behind, right? Who wants to not be in the know? So, But do you think that this is going to cause that gap between uh, blacks and whites, that, that whole information gap, to become wider? Are there going to be a lot of minorities left behind? Well, no, I'm not so sure about that because I was just on social media on Instagram and there's a young lady in the DMV who is doing extremely well in educating uh, the younger generation about AI and how to use AI to start your own business in your, in your college dorm. <laughs> Okay, so the younger generation is on it, and in terms of uh, minorities, they're seeing that, hey, this is a great opportunity for us to get in the door, because a lot of times it doesn't require a college degree. So you're just learning from practice. So again, it comes with being open to the ideas, um, being a uh, lifelong learner, and uh, jumping in the game, getting in it. So this, the young folks are acclimated to technology because a lot of them don't even know what a phone booth is. You're talking about a generation. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yes, generation you are up, so right. They grew up on technology, it's not that foreign to them, but it's the other generations that, when it's fascinating place, we have a lot of expendable income, you also have the opportunity to continue to learn. My kids, they couldn't tell you what a, a, <laughs> a telephone booth looked like opposed to, I mean, let alone using one. Right. What is one, what's the main message you wanted to get across in, in, in writing this? And how long did it take you? Well, it was interesting, Stephanie, because first of all, I had to gather, uh, you know, a, a group of women professionals to believe in the project. Because my idea was, Wow, wouldn't it be nice to have a book that's like a dummies type book for risk management 24-7? Because risk management is so important, but it's not the most exciting subject the way it's written now in college textbooks. No one wants to read that. So how can we attract people to read it? So I gather women who are from some of the companies that you may have patronized, like Walmart, Walgreens, MetLife, GoDaddy, and they're in corporate America, and they said, yes, I want to write for this book. I want to get, you know, be a part of the literature and share with people not only my personal story, but how I manage risk and how I manage risk for the companies that I work for. Um, one of the writers is actually um, uh, from the Marines. You know, she's one of the veterans uh, from the Marines. So she talked about resilience being a r Marine, but also how resilience is important within the organization. What were some of the stories that impacted you most? Did anything surprise you? Well, when the one about the Marines, because I like the fact that she used her personal challenges of being a Marine and how they were trained, right, and creating that resilient mindset and how she leverages her personal experience within her workplace and advises leaders on being resilient as well. And we can do that individually. You know, how we manage risk personally does it translate in how we help our organizations manage risk day to day. So it's a transferable skill. It could be helpful to a lot of people. But in the book, the, the, the writers do that. So I really was taken uh, by the fact that, she, that being a Marine and being a veteran, being a woman, you know, in that in that capacity and being able to translate those skills over was was great. What were some of the disappointments of writing this book? I wish I had more people. <laughs> uh, more people, actually, and really opened my eyes. This is something I learned, though. I learned that regardless of where women are within their career, they still need uh, reinforcement. They need to be still need encouragement. 
Um, they still need to feel like they belong because the higher up you go in an organization, it gets lonely. I'm and, sure. And women want to have that engagement. So a lot of them, a few of them, I, I may add, they were offered new jobs as a result of writing for the book. They were, um, they were given a, an award on their job for being an author in the book. They were given new leadership posi positions in their industry community on councils as a result of writing in the book. So when you share your experience with the world unselfishly, it comes back to you. And I, I've just enjoyed the chance of you know going around doing book signings and sharing this. But that with other people. says a lot about you that you reached out to them. This you were the foundation that gave them the opportunity. Well, that makes me feel good, and I'm going to keep doing it because I realize. I was, uh, okay, you go back to surprises. I was shocked that women of this caliber and at this level in corporate America still needed, needed validation. That's the thing that shocked me the most. But coaching them through this process, because people don't write like this, they write reports, you know, technical reports. They don't write through reflection. So when you write, it opens you up and you see things about yourself or, or it builds your confidence. Oh man, it's that amazing. is just, that's so healthy. Mm -hmm. Because you don't realize it until you're writing it. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. That, and, and you're like, wow. And so many things, you learn so much. What did you learn about you? I learned that I'm a pretty good coach. <laughs> 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 I'm a pretty good coach. I also learned that I need to you know, be more aggressive when it comes to asking for help, because people were more than willing to As being a woman. You know, we don't that's, want that's it. one of those things, right? But uh, I learned how to step out in faith and, and you know, say, would you be interested in doing this? Because I mean, that's a part of sales which I'm not strong in, but it's teaching me it's okay to ask. The power of asking, even if it's a no. There's a lot to be learned from just asking. You never know where your yes is going to come from. I'm telling you. <laughs> so what do you think the future of risk management <laughs> is? Where, do we, yeah. where, where are we going, especially post-COVID? I mean, we had this big thing mm -hmm. happen that changed the course of the world. It did. So where do we go from here? Because companies are different. Every, th things just are shaped differently now. Well, one thing is the supply chain. One, I had an interview, I have a podcast that's uh, same name of the book, Flip This Risk Podcast, and I had a, a leader there who's uh, a, a, a leading supply chain expert in Canada, and she told me that the supply chain before COVID has changed differently, uh, post-COVID. It's not even the same type of supply chain. And she talked about how important it is to bring minorities into the supply chain because Can you if you explain have what the supply chain is? Supply chain is when you order something for Amazon and you get it when they say you do. But there's like 10 steps in between. That's okay. why you could track your order. <laughs> okay. You know, supply chain meaning it's getting from one place to the other to get to the destination. All I know the is destination. there's not as many eggs <laughs> in the supermarket. Well, <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> yeah, that's true. What's going on? <laughs> did it, did like, your supply chain, okay? Yeah, right. Did the chicken strike too? <laughs> right. We want to know what's, what's going on in the situation. But you have so many levels and engagements of vendors for one product. It's not one vendor. You have different points within the system where it's like the, the general simming line for a car. You know, just in time, someone puts on the headlights, someone puts in the motor, someone puts on the exhaust. So if any one of those things within the chain is not there, you have a gap in your chain that slows down the supply, the distribution of the supply, the delivery of the product. So during COVID and during, you know, with the Ukraine war and all these other perfect storms happening and the labor force, and COVID, that's, that's a, a perfect storm, right? Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of companies that were not able to, you know, get the microchips for the cars. Um, people stopped working um, during COVID. Things shut down, the factories, less people. And we're still seeing the residual effect of the risk. Even now, we don't have enough restaurant workers. Uh, restaurant workers who used to be in the in their service industry decided to jump on the AI wagon because it's easy entry thanks to AI. So there's a lot of benefits to a lot of things we think are high-end risk 
So this upside and downside, for every risk that's, that's a downside, it's an upside for someone else. So do you think things, how long will it be before we reach some kind of normal? <laughs> well, okay. what's normal? We redefine that's true. It, but, that's true. But what's normal, you know, we redefine normal, which is also an opportunity because that means that you can define what your new normal is, mm. all right, in the times of chaos. And, that, you know, that's important too. So it all depends on what your perspective is. So we're redefining normal right now. So everyone has an opportunity to contribute to what that should be. There's a lot of uncertainty right now, which makes people. Uh, have anxious. a lot of anxiety, yes. yeah, a lot of very anxious, which is uh, makes sense, which is reasonable. There's nothing wrong with that. That's being real, but that shouldn't keep us from planning and anticipating what could be, right? What is the next big thing that could happen that you can't imagine? Not what you can imagine, what you can't imagine, because risk is about not what you know; it's about what you don't know, and how can you know what you don't know? So now the book is available everywhere now. The book is yes, it's, it is it's out. It's out. It's available everywhere. Yeah, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble online, Walmart online. Uh, you can go to my website, flipthisriskbooks.com. And will they find out other information like on your website as well about oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, risk management? Yeah, risk management. Uh, I do training for companies who want to get, you know, l learn a little bit more about this and make it helpful, make them, make them more productive and you know, performance driven for the future. You can't be successful in a business if you don't manage your risk. I think that's the message I want to leave here. And there's a way, structured way to do that within your organization. Are com there are companies that are too big or too small? No. Actually, that's a good question. Uh, no, any company can apply this. You can be a nonprofit, you could be a big corporation, an LLC, employees 50, 100, 10,000, doesn't make a difference. If you have a goal, a mission, an objective, you manage risk. The question is how well do you manage risk? And you want to get people on board with the education before that big thing happens. Thank you so much for joining us. It's We've been talking to Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Karen Hardy, and the name of the book is Flip This Risk. Why'd you name it that? Oh, yeah. I named it that because I wanted to give a spin on risk management. Flip the risk in your favor, and that's what the back of the book says. <laughs> <laughs> Flip it in your favor. It could be a good thing. Thank you so much <laughs> for joining us today. Again, we've been talking to Dr. Karen Hardy. Name of the book, Flip This Risk for Enterprise Security. You've been watching the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant. Enjoy the rest of your day.